So, you know, I kind of want to just first get started, right? You, uh, obviously, you manage 21 Savage. Uh, you know, you are the president of a record label. I've seen you, you know, take a few private planes and all that good stuff. Like, is this where you are right now? Is this everything that you kind of envisioned for yourself and wanted for yourself when you first started pursuing this? Um, to be honest, I didn't really know how far I was going to make it or when I was going to make it. Um, and I didn't know what capacity I would make it, you know what I mean? Uh, not to say that I'm like, like I'm Diddy status or anything like that, but like I never thought I'd be on a private jet. That's not at all what I envisioned. Um, I think I just wanted like, you know, when I first started, I just wanted to get from being broke. Like I just was like, I'm, I want to eat real meals. I want to, <laughs> I want to travel and take vacations. You know, I want to buy myself stuff, and I wasn't able to do that up until really I met Savage. So. Yeah, and and you know, let's let's kind of take it back for a second. Like, at, at what point you were born in '84, right? Yeah. Okay, so. What was kind of the music that you were listening to then? And like, how did you get involved with the music and specifically hip hop? And like, how did you know, like, you know what, this is, this, this connects with me. How did you know? Um, you know, what's crazy. I actually, I went to a white schools growing up, right? So I was always like the only black girl in the classroom, the only black girl on the soccer team. Uh, so I grew up listening to a lot of rock and roll music, right? Mostly because of MTV used to play everything, but I was really kind of more gravitating towards like, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Foo Fighters, Smashing Pumpkins, like real 90s rock shit, you know what I mean? Um, it wasn't until I heard, I mean, I listened to rap music, don't get it twisted, like I was listening to urban music and everything, but it wasn't until I heard Outkast, uh, Spody Odi Dopalicious on the radio, Greg Street played it like 15 times on the radio, like literally 15 times, like back to back to back to back to back, like yo. This is amazing. Like it was kind of like a life-changing moment for me. And at the time, I think I was playing instruments too. So it was like a really like I thought that was a really musical song. I was like, yeah, I want to be in music. I just didn't know what I what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then, I guess, kind of fast-forwarding a little bit, you went to what is Elon University, right, in North Carolina, and then you studied journalism. So. Right. Was that the, the route that you thought you would take is, you know, just maybe trying to be a, a journalist, you know, within hip hop and then, you know, maybe kind of, I don't know, Elliot Wilson type of thing? Like, what, what was that? Yeah, I mean, I grew up collecting, like, music magazines, so, like, Rap Up, Word Up, Vibe, The Source, like, that was everything that was on my walls at the time. It was all magazines, and I was just like, well, I like music and I like writing, so let me just be a music journalist, you know, and I studied that. Um, but also while I was in college, I like ran the recording studio that we had in the communications building. So anybody that wanted to make music, like they would go through me to book studio time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I just kind of developed an affinity for being around musicians. You know what I mean? So I didn't know that I was going to be a manager until someone asked me to be their manager. So. How do you, like, when someone just kind of asks you to be, I mean, like, what is, how do you know what to do? Because I feel like, you know, a lot of times somebody says, yo, I want to manage you or I need a manager, but it's like, you don't even have the resources to really help anybody, you know? And if both of y'all are broke, I mean, what are y'all going to do, right? So, like, when you were asked for the first time, like, can you be my manager, what was the game plan and, like, what was the strategy behind that? Um, and who was it too? Like who who, yeah, who reached so out? There was this kid. Uh, he's kind of like a, a legend now, but his name is Grip Plies from Atlanta. Rest in peace. Um, he had asked me to manage him. I think because I was able just to get a crowd in a room. Because at the time, once I graduated college, I started throwing parties um, to create like a means of income. Because I was working at like Enterprise Rent a Car. It was the shittiest job ever. Um, but obviously, that's not what I wanted to do. So I was throwing parties. I was blogging and I was still being a writer on the side, right? So he asked me to manage him and I was like, okay, that sounds cool, I'm, I'm down. Um, and the only reason I knew really what a manager did was because when I was interning as a journalist at um, Complex and The Source, I got a chance to talk to Bun B's manager. And I basically did a profile on him, like what does a manager do? And I was just like, oh, okay, so this is what a manager is, right? Uh, so once I came to the conclusion that my job would be creating streams, streams of income for this person, it really just became like, okay, so what's the first steps to making money? Okay, make some dope music. How do we get the dope music to other people? Get it on blogs, do shows, do parties, whatever, whatever, and things just started to come together. But but how do you how do you create value for somebody who literally 
has no value at that point, right? Like, I mean, to maybe for you, you know, you, you see it, but trying to convince other people, you know, they, they may not catch on. So how do you how do you create value when there's literally like nothing there, you know? Uh, I mean, honestly, it all starts with the music. Like when I met Savage, he had one song, um, but that one song was really incredible to me. You know, I was like, oh, this is really hard. I think people would like it. Um, and it was just kind of like creating its own steam on, on SoundCloud, and then we just, kind of built from there, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I'm properly answering your question, but like. No, 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 you, you are. I mean, it's it's basically just like, you know, if, if you're trying to go from ground zero to, mm -hmm. to 100, it's like, well, where do I start? Okay, yes, I feel like I got dope music, but like, is there a need for me to brand myself when nobody knows who I am at all? Like, Yeah, it's kind of like starting a business. I don't know if anybody's ever started a business. like. If you're creating a startup, you're, you're, let's say you wanted to start at McDonald's or you wanted to start a fast food chain, you're literally just following the steps of creating a brand. Um, you're just using, it's a person, right? So that's everything from, all right, what does your logo look like? What does your website look like? What does your merch potentially look like? Um, what do your videos look and feel like? You know what I mean? Like literally every piece of, of a brand is what I did for Savage and any other artist that I work with first. Because like you have to establish that identity so that when the crowd sees you or whoever you're marketing to, they're like, I like how that looks. I like how it sounds. I like how it feels. I want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And with Savage particularly, like, you know, his image is very aggressive, right? Um, how do you how do you market somebody like that? I mean, because I mean, if we're going to keep it, you know, real, like a, a lot of hip hop fans are don't are, are white, right? And so like how do you how do you market somebody who really doesn't look like these kids like, you know, and let them know like, hey, it's okay, you can listen to his music, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of that is just like kids are rebellious, right? Like when I was young, like I didn't want to do what everyone else was doing or I didn't want to do what my parents were saying. So I think Savage, like with his image, um, he's intriguing and his story is, is special, so people are just naturally gravitating towards him. They're like living vicariously through him. Like seeing the knife on his head when I met him, I was like, oh shit, this ain't no like. I mean, does that, does that scare you at all? Like, because for some people, they would be like, you know what, this is not the type of person I need to be around, right? Or yeah. even try to do business with. Like, you know, like why, what I, was it? I was never scared of him just because I saw something in him that was just like, oh, he's special. And I knew that to get a tattoo like that on, on your face, um, it, it says a lot of things. Not only are you bold, but you don't give a fuck. Um, and that, that is kind of a special trait that you can't really duplicate in people. Like, artists like to say they don't give a fuck, but they do. But he actually didn't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, he had yeah. almost lost his life before. He really felt like he had nothing to lose. So it was like, whatever, I'm going to tap this knife on my head and see what happens. And then, and then I think it's, I mean, we all, obviously we got to talk about when he, when he just was, I think it was the Vlad TV interview and he just goes, it's a knife. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, did you know immediately, like, yo, we gotta run with that? Yeah, you know, because like, Twitter was making it like a thing. Like, I don't know if anyone like really follows him, but like, he's probably the most viral rapper, like, in the and last does the simplest few things. Years. I mean, and yeah. he just he's just himself. That, I think that's the himself. crazy part is like right. he's himself, and then all of a sudden it just it just kicks off. Right. right. He's just naturally funny on accident. Like, he doesn't know that he's being funny. Like, he said that and was actually mad at dude. Like, bro, it's clearly a knife. <laughs> Like he was mad as hell at the interview, but it's like that moment kind of like stamped him um, beyond just having dope music because kids were like, yo, that's that kid that said it's a knife and it just grew, you know, out of proportion. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I mean, for you, was that your idea to kind of run with that branding of, you know, the, with the It's an Album and, you know, all of that kind of following or how, how did that? Yeah, it was kind of a collective team thing because um, myself and my partner, Meezy, and Savage were like, yeah, we gotta do something with that. Um, and then it became, it's a tour. And then we had like all his merch, we'd have Issa on it. And then we were just like, oh, okay, we should just name the album Issa. Because it was such a like viral, viral moment for yeah. him. So yeah, we just had to capitalize on it. Yeah. And, um, you know, let's kind of, let's, let's take it back a little bit. When you were going and you were graduating from, from college, like, First of all, like, what was the plan? Like, what when you graduated from college, like, were you like, okay, I got this degree, I think I can do X, Y, and Z? Because that's how I was when I graduated. Like, I felt like, okay, I can, I can do anything, right? And then you kind of get out into the working world and you kind of see, like, okay, this is not as easy as they made it seem, right? So what, what was the plan for you and how did that kind of evolve as, as you grew? Um, I'll be honest, like, when I graduated, I didn't really have much of a plan. 
Um, I moved back home because moving directly to New York was just... Back home to Atlanta. Yeah, back right. home to Atlanta, yeah. right. So I moved back home to Atlanta, and I wanted to move to New York, but it was really expensive, so it was just like, I ain't no way in hell I'm about to move to New York. I can't afford it unless I have a job. So I started working an Enterprise rental car and like three months after I started working, my mom's charging me rent. So <laughs> I didn't have no bread. I, didn't, I had no idea what I was gonna do. I was just like, well, uh, I'm just gonna start doing what seems right, which was throwing parties, blogging, and kind of creating a name for myself back home because you know I hadn't been home in four years. So I kind of created a name for myself in that like hipster, rap moment or that like movement that we had going on. Wait, around what year was that? Like 20? That was 2000, like six and seven. Okay. I graduated okay. college in 06. Okay. okay. I'm really old, y'all. Um, for y'all, I know that's really old. Um, so yeah, that was like 06 to like 09. I was just throwing parties, meeting people, picking up different artists, interning at record labels, excuse me, not record labels, um, recording studios. Um, and just kind of making my way until somebody just was like, yo, manage me, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I never really had a plan until I had to like figure it out because I had to hit rock bottom before I was like, okay, I gotta get my life together. I what, didn't grow up till I was like 25. What, what, what was rock bottom? I mean, for you, you know? Man, rock bottom was like doing all the stuff that you're not supposed to do when you have a degree, right? Like, I can't even say some of these things in this, <laughs> in this room. Like I was doing whatever I had to do um, to pay rent and not move back in with my mom, because eventually I moved out trying to be grown. Um, and I got evicted from my first apartment. She had to come save me. And then my second apartment, I was like, I'm not calling her. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I'm cracking cards. I'm, you know, <laughs> selling dimes and nicks and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Just to not call it, her. I mean, mom. it was a pride thing at that point, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's just like, she's going to say, uh, you, you don't have your shit together. You need to grow up. And I didn't want to hear that. And I'm my only child, so it's like, yeah. I get it bad from both sides. Both my parents were just like, yo, we sent you to college to do this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I mean, were you able to kind of tell her, like, you know, I think I'm interested in music? I mean, were you able to have Well, that... I was managing, right? So yeah. I was managing in 2008, it's the first time I had, that was my first client, literally 10 years ago. Um, but we weren't making no money. But she would see me, like, going to California and then going to South by Southwest. With like, on your own dollar, like you're investing, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I'm spending all my own money uh, with this artist just trying to get his face out there and you know, get a, make a name for him and make a name for myself. Um, but she's just like, when are you gonna get a real job? Because eventually I had like, gotten fired from two jobs, so she was just like what, like, what are you doing with your life? You know what I mean? It wasn't until probably January of this year she stopped asking me when I was gonna get a job. <laughs> I swear to you, like, it's not even a joke. Even, I mean, even like, you know, you would show her all the success and she would still, I mean, is well, she like old school? Is she like kind of a little bit more old school? To well, where? all of our parents are kind of old school. Um, she's just like one of those, like worked for a job, one company for 18 years, so she didn't really get it. Yeah. Um, until she became my business manager and she saw what was coming into my account. Right. And she stopped asking oh, me and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I was gonna get a job, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I, I struggled for a long time. Rock bottom, honestly, was like, I got into a car accident, it was this Honda Civic, 1996 Honda Civic, my first car. And I got a check from Geico for like four grand. Mind you, at the time, my mom had been laid off. We was about to lose the house, lose the car. And I like... And are you with, are you, are you living with her at the time? At this time, yeah. Okay, so okay. I had, had to move home because out of my second apartment, I got evicted, so I had to go home. So I got a check for like three or $4,000. I gave my mom half and then I hit up Complex like, yo, I need a job. Like, are you guys hiring for anything? Like, entry level, I don't care what it is, I'll take it. And um, just so happened they were hiring for an assistant. And I was like, okay, let me come up there. I'll do the interview, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I get the job. And then, like, the rest is like history. That was 2010. Yeah. So, how did you break out of the, the, uh, the typical nine to five job, right? Like, how did you break out of the, the survival job? Because I think there's a lot of people who, you know, I, I, I want to do this, and I but I have to have this nine to five, right. you know. But then all of a sudden, you know, three, four, five years down the road, you're still doing that nine to five, and your passion kind of it dies away. How did you make sure that you weren't one of those people who had this passion, and then just you know your nine to five kind of took over? Yeah. So in um, 2014 or 15, I was managing Key, Fat Man Key, um, and he was starting to actually you know make money. You know, we were touring, we were getting like little brand looks. Um, so I might have been making like five to seven grand a month from him while I was working a job. 
Um, so that plus my, my job money, I was like, oh, that's kind of some decent money. Um, and at the time, my girl was like, yeah, I don't want to be in New York anymore. Let's move to LA. And I was like, all right. So I went into my job and told them like, yo, um, I'm not quitting, but I'll freelance for you guys, right? Like just pay me a little something, which is basically like whatever my apartment rent was in LA. I was like, just pay me that and I'll just get your brand popping in, in LA. That was 10 deep. So I don't I, this was like by the grace of God, dude was like, okay. So I quit working for him. I just took a risk. I was just like, yo, I'm making enough from key to where I can really kind of survive. So let me just figure it out from there. But how do you know when it is time? Because I think a lot of, you know, you, you, it's either you wait and you wait and you wait until, you know, you're able to make maybe as much money or maybe a little bit less than your nine to five, like, or you just go straight into it and you might be broke for however many years, but you know, you're trying to build something. Like, how did you know? And like, how do you assess the risk of, of trying to be an entrepreneur? Um, I'm by nature not a very risky person, so I literally like had to make sure I had an apartment. And, like I literally sat down like, okay, this is going to be my monthly expenses, and this is how much I'm going to need to make every single month if I'm going to quit my job. And I would just make sure that I was making that amount of money every single month, whether it was from Key or or you know Ten Deep paying. How many how many months did you plan it? Like was it six? And you were like, okay, for, if if no, I can no, make like, this for the next six months, then I think I'll I'll make it happen. Or like it was like three months for real. For real. okay, I was like. I'm tired of living here. New York wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. She was ready to go, and I was like, all right. In three months, we move. I don't care what dude says, we're moving. Yeah. So. And then, you know, kind of taking it back a little bit, you you talk about how you were, uh, you wanted to, you were willing to kind of intern and, and do whatever you kind of needed to do to, mm -hmm. to get it popping. So, how do you feel? Because I think a few months ago, there was this big kind of debate about Internships. internships should they be yeah should they be paid should they be unpaid should you take them i think you had a pretty strong stance uh, about you know taking an unpaid internship but like what is what, what is your viewpoint and, and how do you view people who uh, or i guess kind of younger people who say no i want to be paid for my time versus those who are kind of a little bit more willing to to sacrifice financially i mean there's certain industries where i feel like you should be paid for an internship like if you're working in architecture or you're in engineering you should probably be paid because you legitimately need to know a certain amount of knowledge to do the job. Music, I, I meet idiots every day. <laughs> like, you don't have to be a genius to do this shit. You don't have to have a degree. Don't drop out of school. But <laughs> it's like, you really don't need to have any sort of knowledge. You just have to have a work ethic and be resourceful and maybe creative and know people, right? Um, so when it comes to internships, it's like, I literally could choose anybody in this room to do this internship. So why would I, why would I pay you? Like, it's like, it's a competitive thing. So if you're good at your job, yeah, eventually you will get paid. Um, but at first you gotta kinda prove why I should pay you. Because you could just be an idiot that has no resources, can't figure it out, you know what I'm saying? So you gotta work for free for a little while. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, was a college degree, do you think it was necessary for what you're doing now? No. Not at all, no. Do you think, do you think the experience of college it was necessary for, for what you're doing now? I think some of the life skills that it taught me as far as like survival, um, because at that point in college, like you can't hit up your mom every week when you need something. So if anything, college for me was like just teaching me how to kind of grow up a little bit, because even though like after I graduated, I was still effing up every week. But I think that college has taught me life skills and networking and just how to move. You know what I mean? What, it, talking about networking, like what were, what were some of your, your early networking techniques to try to like get on essentially? You know, like what were you trying to do and how have they evolved since? Yeah, I think it was just about being involved in different activities. Um, like I was in National Association of Black Journalists as, as a college student. Um, and I met a lot of people from that that I still keep in touch with to this day. And all those people, you know, have great jobs, either like Google, YouTube, HBO, um, Vibe, whatever, but it's, it's all about just staying in touch and, and, and when you meet people, just creating that relationship. So um, being active was really important for me because in, you know, in NABJ, we traveled to New York. That was like a big opportunity for me. Um, my internships, everybody that I met, I keep in touch with to this day. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, it's just like just being in it and meeting people and being, making sure you stay in touch. I tell my intern or my assistant all the time, like the people that you switch that real quick. Yeah, yeah he's paid now. So yeah, I have to, like, there you go. Change that up. But yeah. I tell them all the time, like the people that you're coming up with right now are the people that are going to be successful with you in like five to 10 years. So stay in touch because that's the truth. Like I can literally name at least two or three people that I know from an internship that are like managing a successful artist right now or running a label. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and talking a little bit about running a label, um, you you ran a label in college, right? Mm -hmm. So, what? How did? First of all, how did you start this label with probably limited resources? And then now that you have, you know, since the '80s, like how has? Do you think that people should wait until you have funding to start a label, or like how did? Like kind of talk about the, the pros and cons of, of starting a label. Well, in, in college, to be honest, it was just something that was cool because it wasn't like I had artists or anything, right? Like, we had a logo, we had a MySpace page, right? So it was like, oh, yeah, we're a label. Um, so you, we, you basically just kind of came Yeah, yeah we yeah, weren't, like, yeah. dropping music on, like... like no contracts and, like, yeah, nothing like, like yeah, I didn't okay. sign no yeah, yeah, yeah. So, But it sounded really cool. This was a time when, like, Kanye was getting lit, so it was called, like, So Official Super... It was really weird and whack. Um... <laughs> So it wasn't like I needed resources or needed money to do what I was doing in college. Um, but now, you know, um, I do think you need a little bit of money to, to start a label, but you really just need to be resourceful. And I think that's with, with anything in music, is like learning how to figure it out. That's my favorite thing to, turn, to tell interns, like, you'll figure it out, don't ask me nothing because you, you gotta figure it out, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and so now, you know, what are, what are kind of like some of the things that when running a label, like you kind of maybe didn't necessarily think about beforehand, you know, like now that you have since the 80s and you have artists and you know, you're really starting to get a lot of momentum, what are kind of like some of the things you're like, yo, I didn't, I didn't know it'd be this difficult or, or maybe maybe it's not yeah. so difficult, I don't know, like what no, was your difficult. experience been? Um, honestly, for me, the most difficult part is like the business part of it. And when I say that, I mean like publishing and paperwork and like a bunch of contracts and negotiations. Like I'm not, I'm a business, I'm an entrepreneur, but business isn't my favorite thing to do. Like I like to deal in the creative world of stuff and the marketing and talk to the artists, be in the studio. Like that's my expertise. But I didn't realize that like, oh, I got to go out and sign an artist. I got to negotiate how much I'm going to sign them for, how much of the splits I'm going to keep, how much of the publishing I want. Like, I really don't care about that. I just want to get the music out and for the artist to be bigger. You know what I mean? So that's probably the hardest part is actually having to be the business person and be a creative person. Yeah. And, and what's, what's kind of the, the overall goal for Since the 80s? And, and I think you also need to, to give you, give you a, a pat on the back because, you know, one of the artists that you signed, uh, Malik, you know, produced a... a that he used to manage this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that he's talking about. Right? Yeah. So uh, we're like, Malik used to live like five minutes away from me. Um, and so... Um, Malie actually just produced on the, the Ariana Grande album as well. So, like, who other, who, who else do you kind of have on your roster and, and kind of explain what Since the 80s is as a whole and where it's trying to go? Yeah, so Since the 80s is a, um, it's kind of an umbrella for management, label, and publishing. Um, my client roster plus my partner's client roster. So that's 21 Savage, Earth Gang, J.I.D., Malik, Chase the Money, who's a producer from, um, excuse me, St. Louis. Uh, Pyrex, who's a producer from Baltimore. Neomza, who's from Chicago. Azian, she's from LA. Bunch of underground artists right now. Um, but our, our biggest thing is artist development, which I think a lot of labels kind of neglect. Well, major labels do. Explain that a little bit. So development is essentially um, like raising a child, right? Or training a puppy, like literally. Like that's what it is, is like, um, taking the artist from A and then getting them to maybe D and then getting them to M and then getting them to Z and every step in between. So it's vocal lessons, dance lessons, um, you know, working with different producers to build a project, a body of work, uh, connecting people or connecting the artist with, you know, the right people to shoot a video, the right person to do a photo shoot, like literally building every single piece of the team because that's what I did with Savage. You know, like every single person that's a part of his team, I brought them in to help grow his career, to help create those streams of income. So that's what we're doing with like every single artist on the roster. But I mean, like what's really the difference between, you know, being a manager and being a label? I mean, these days, right? These if, days, you're, if you're doing the same things, yeah. you know? These days there's absolutely no difference because um, 
now you don't really need a label to be successful. So the manager is becoming um, just a multi-hat wearing person, right? Like I've made 21's, 21's current website, I made that. His first like 15 releases of merch, I creative directed that. Um, you know, we, we put out his projects independently on DistroKid. I just signed up on DistroKid, uploaded the project, and then that was it. We did that for the first like four projects of his career. You know what I mean? Like we didn't. I mean, we were making millions of dollars before we signed that thing. Yeah. Wait, and and then so so how did but how did you get there, right? Because I think there's a lot of people who, you know, they're like, well, I put my album, I put my last eleven albums on DistroKid, and I. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know how do you how do you take those steps when it's yeah. like there is so much music out there and it's so difficult to to stand out? I mean, how do you how do you how do you take those steps? And then how do you know when to when to throw in the towel and be like, you know, this isn't it? A lot of people never find that out. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a combination of things because Savage is is special in that his story is unlike most people. You know what I mean? Like this is a man that's been shot nine times. Um, you know, his best friend died sitting literally next to him, right? No one can duplicate that story and and be authentic because that's not happened to a lot of people. Right. So I think that him just being original and then just having dope music. Plus he came out at a time when like nobody was being a street, everybody was just flossing and had chains and a bunch of girls and everybody was like just rich. Nobody was talking about that little struggle part, you know what I mean, coming up from like the mud. So I think it's, you know, being original, timing, and then having a manager that kind of just knew the internet. Like I was a nerd. So it was like taking that, that street, like specialness, and then putting it on the internet, and then working the streets, my partner. All of that together is what made him successful. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I kind of want to take it back a little bit. I mean, you talk about all of the things that he's been through, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you how do you manage somebody who's been through so much trauma, not only emotionally, but mentally, maybe even physically? You know, like, how do, how do you find that balance of, of being like, listen, like, you know, you might need to do this, but you don't want to overstep because, you know, mm -hmm. it's their journey. Like, how, has that conversation ever come up with Savage? Or, like, how do you, how do you kind of deal with that? Yeah, I think at first, um you know, Savage asked me to manage him because he saw something in me that I could offer him. Um, and I don't know if that's like just me being a nurturing woman because I'm, I'm a woman. So naturally, like I can kind of console people, make them feel a little better and a little more comfortable. So I think he felt comfortable with me and felt like he could trust me a little bit more than he might have, you know, a street dude. Because um, I'm sure other people asked him to get involved in his career, but, you know, he selected me. Um, and then a lot of times, like early on with Savage, I didn't know how to say th things to him. And that's where Meezy, my partner, comes in. Like he's like almost a translator for me and telling Savage, like, yo, look, Uzi's not paying you a lot on this tour, but we got to do it. And here's why. You know what I'm saying? Like we were making maybe 25,000, 30,000 a show in nightclubs, but we had to convince him to go on tour with Uzi for $1,000 a night. That was like a real conversation. Because he's like, why the fuck would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making all this money, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But we had to break it down for him, but he trusts us. So it's really about trust, you know what I mean? So it's not about like him being scared. Like I've never been scared of Savage. I'm not scared of him today. It's just like knowing how to communicate something to somebody and them trusting you. Yeah, and I think also something that you touched on, um, you know, you were saying how, you know, you're a woman and, and naturally you're just, you know, just nurturing. But um, I think it's, it's important to say, I mean, you are an African-American lesbian. Like, that has got to be probably, there's so many cards stacked up against you, you know? Like, you know, you're black, you're a woman, you know, you're, you're a lesbian. Like, there's, there's, how, do you, how did you beat the odds, you know? Like, that, that's gotta be difficult, especially in the music yeah. industry, where it's run by men, um, particularly, you know, white men. And, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did you make it through? Yeah, people ask me that a lot, and my answer is always kind of weird because I grew up in the suburbs, right? So around a bunch of white people. So, um, and I don't mean this offensively to anyone, but like I speak white fluently. So when yes. I go into a room, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm on their level, so automatically the guards come a little down. And then once they realize that, um, you know, I'm actually a cool person because I kind of can be kind of standoffish and I'm unapproachable. But I think once people kind of realize that 
I'm cool and I'm not like a threat and scary, that um, people are just more open and willing to work with me. I've never actually had issues with white men. Funnily enough, it's usually black men that give me more stress than the white men do. Really? How so? Um, it's just, I don't know if it's like a, I don't know if it's like a sexuality thing. Like older black men can be kind of old school. So it's kind of like, oh, I don't really support that. I don't really know what that's about. But I like you, but I don't know what that's about. Like white men never gave me that. Really? Yeah. Really. But I mean, how does that, I mean, because I feel like, you know, the personal and the business, that, that should always be separate. But I, that's, that's an interesting um, it's yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty, sometimes people don't know, but I think it's pretty obvious that I'm a gay woman, but some people don't know. Like, I had, I was on tour, and I had, like, three girls with me, and, like, they're all bad, from Detroit. <laughs> and the tour manager's was like, wait, you're a lesbian? This is, like, the 30th day. I'm like, yo, are you serious? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm an actual lesbian. Wow. In the flesh. <laughs> In the flesh. <laughs> but, um. Yeah, I've never had issues with white dudes, ever, or white people. Um, I think just because I've always just known how to, you know, function in that environment. That's actually the main reason I didn't go to HBCU is because I felt like had I gone to a, a predominantly African American university, I wouldn't have been able to um, swim as quickly. And that's no offense to anybody. It's just like I felt like I needed to be in a reality, like a world that was more real, to kind of teach me and prepare me for what I was going to face. Yeah, and and. You know, I kind of want to also just touch on, like, how long was your journey to get to where you are? You know, because I think a lot of people see, you know, this overnight thing or, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it, could, it took a couple years or whatever. They just saw you coming up with Savage, you know, maybe a few years ago. For you, how long was that process? Uh, literally seven years, I guess. Maybe like five. Because I was, I was at least making money with Key, like, once I started, like, really getting into it. But like five to seven years. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Truth or dare? Truth. When, when everything is all said and done, right, and the phones are off, uh, and it's just, you know, you're, you're kind of ending the night, um, who is Key Henderson? Without 21 Savage, without since the 80s, without your phone, without music, who is, who is Key? That's crazy. I'm a really boring person, bro. All I do is work. Trey will tell you, like, I don't have any kind of fun. And I think that's because I worked for so long to where I, like, all I was doing was just putting in work and seeing no results. And now that I'm seeing results, I'm obsessed. Like literally, even now with the gym, like I get up every day and go to the gym no matter what, because now I'm obsessed with the results. So honestly, when my phone is off, I might talk to my girl sometimes or I watch sometimes. a lot of yeah, I don't even like to overdo it with that because it's like, yo, I got shit to do. I haven't, I don't have $5 million in my account. So it's like, I gotta like go a little bit harder because it's like, I'm 34 years old. I don't want to be doing music in 10 years. Like, I need to be up and out of here. You know what I'm saying? So I be real focused. I don't do nothing. I'm like, I don't smoke weed. I don't drink anymore. Like, I'm real like. <laughs> Key Henderson, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure.